Hello, my name is John Spangle. Welcome to my YouTube channel. As always, I explain on title the underground. I was thinking about the underground church in present-day China and Iran. Another place of outpouring the Holy Spirit, just gathering by the body of Christ before we are called up uh, before God. We are at the end of the church age. The church is not purified by during the seven-year tribulation the Jewish people are. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The church is purified solely by the complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained before ordained that we should walk in them. Many times Jesus taught in parables, and he gave us six parables that a lot of times I used in reference to the pre-tribulation rapture, because that's kind of that's the theme of them. Uh, the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, I think it's the most uh, one that everybody uh, understands what that's about. Uh, some people don't understand that the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30, and parable of testing of servants, Luke 12, 42 through 48, referred to, uh, like I'm doing here, trying to work for the kingdom of God, bring one more to God. It explains about those servants while they're waiting for their master on a long journey. He comes back. Uh, Talks about three servants, uh, two that, that, that doubled uh, what they had, uh, but the third servant uh, hid what he was given because he didn't. He was a fear of the Lord, and therefore it refers to where they do with him. They send him to where there's uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That always refers to hell. And so we are expected to be working for the kingdom of God. We are not saved by works. Not, there's a lot of people out there that teach that. That is incorrect. That's man's teaching, not God's. But because we are saved. We do work for the kingdom. We're expected to. We've all got different kinds of talents. We need to, uh, we are to mature uh, spiritually. We start out with meek, uh, milk of the scripture, so we are like babes. And later we get the meat of the scripture, we are more mature. We are like adults. And so, therefore, there's a growing period of time. Yes, there's a time of learning, but once we get to a certain, uh, spiritually, a certain place, we are to work for God's kingdom. And we also have the parable of the marriage feast, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. The parable of the Great Supper, Luke 14, 16 through 24. And, of course, the parable of the long journey, Luke 19, 11 through 27. Now, 14 times Jesus Christ warned about a pre-tribulation rapture, and he gave warnings like such. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Uh, many times he warns us about pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I got up this morning, I, I looked at my video I made yesterday. I had many comments, and I love the comments where people uh, mean well, or they're excited about us, uh, Christ coming for us. That's uh, great. I had uh, two comments, and I, I went to prayer. Uh, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'll uh, react to comments. Sometimes I don't. Um, by all means, I don't want you not comment. Um, unfortunately, they'll have those people that come against you. I had one person that uh, came up and said, I do this out of love, and he talks about false doctrine. And so I apologize for the person that commented to that person. I didn't mean to delete you, but I did delete that, that comment, what they put out there. I was going to write some stuff to that person. I thought, no, they're not coming here to, uh, um, you know, they were trying to correct me, saying they was correcting, like, Jesus, uh, Pharisees need to correct about Jesus. In other words, they don't believe in pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. And this person that's been to more than one video, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get it. They're not here to learn, they're here to attack, attack. So I took that off there. I had another person, and see people twist things. You know, one, one person put out there, uh, I'm confused about something, and then he, he writes a big paragraph, but he twists things around. And if you go over the paragraph, I went over it five, six times, and I took it to God before I, I, uh, uh, because the other comment, there was no doubt. I was not going. I was going to leave that on there, and I thought, now nah, just go ahead. This person, there's, there's, they're not here. Like I said, to learn, you can tell here they're attacking the doctrine. And then the other person is being dishonest. There, I went over it many times, and and to God, and I was like, because they they put things in there, they put in how uh, 
the last trump. Then they use the verses out of Revelation that talks about the last trump. And then they talk about how um, in in First Corinthians it talks about uh, Paul. Paul talked about how we go up at the last trump. Absolutely. And then he refers that to the same trumpet. And then he starts going in by us American Christians and this and that. And I'm like, uh, you're Christian. Doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. Um, a born again Christian. But there were some things in there that just took me the wrong way. And it was like, I'm, I, I believe that sometimes that could be the Holy Spirit. But I'm not saying I'm holier than that. Or, and then I've got some special connection. But it's something that just kept going on me saying, this person's trying to call strife. That's the reason why some of the comments I'll take off that they're trying to call strife here. And, but the last trump is something I hear a lot of times people trying to push things. Understand the rapture is always referred, Jesus Christ always referred to a Galilean wedding. Well, what happens in Galilean wedding is you'll have an announcement. They'll, they'll, they'll use trumpets and a lot of other things, and they'll announce the coming of the bridegroom. That's to let the uh, uh, soon-to-be bride understand he's coming for her. And then there'll be a trumpet for her to come out to meet him. See, there's, there's different kinds. Like in the parable of the ten virgins, talks about how um, they say the, he, the groom's coming, and then they say the groom's arrived. Prepare yourself. The groom's arrived. That's what that means. So there's more than one series of trumpets. So when it refers to the last trump, it's talking about uh, the last of the series of trumpets. We go out and meet him. He will come in the clouds. There'll be trumpets him coming in the clouds, and there'll be trumpets for us to go out to meet him in the clouds. It's, it's that simple, but people try to use the flesh to twist things and uh, 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 do things like that to, uh, uh, to twist the scripture and stuff. And that's what people do. They try to uh, call this person saying I'm confused is really I'm not confused, but they're trying to bring confusion here to this channel. That's why I put them off, off the thing. And that's why I do. Majority of the time, I don't... Uh, I used to do that, and I used to fight comments, and then got to the point where I'm like, there's, there's no reason for this. Um, I, I allow comments because there has been times where people have asked questions for more, and then, but my videos, uh, the thing is, they'll come and may see a video, but not realize, or maybe look at the channel, and you could look at all my videos and find answers to your questions. By all means, I've done things over and over and over. I've answered every possible question about pre-tribulation rapture by doing videos. And so that's what this channel is about. It's instructions and bringing one more to the kingdom of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. We're about to talk about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And I'll explain in a minute where we're, where we're going over this verse and why it's important. But uh, 10 through 12 talks about after we go up, God will send strong delusion. And for those who... who uh, one who were living unrighteous wanted to believe in a lie and are damned. Who are these people? These are the people that have heard the gospel. All right. A lot of times we, we hear these left behind books, movies. I always talk against that. And we have all that stuff, you know, and people are like, well, leave, leave a, a note behind. Why? There's no reason that, to leave a note behind. Uh, because those family members you love and friends you talk to about the gospel, you go up. They're damned. There's going to be a, a, you know, I've talked about great deception before. A UFO thing, you know, how aliens could be aliens. We're, we can speculate all we want, but it's God is our creator. He can make just people have amnesia. He don't need to do UFO thing. You know, so uh, I don't claim to know the exact delusion. But once a person's deluded, they're deluded. And if God sends them delusion, it's not to bring them out. There's no second chance for them. And that's where miss. I've even did a video about second chance. That's where people just don't get it. There is no second chance for those people. Now, people come argumentative. Well, there's Revelation chapter 7. Uh, there's a vast number of people that come out of the seven-year tribulation. Absolutely. Uh, there's over 12 million Jews on the face of the earth that have not heard. I mean, they may have heard the gospel, but for them, they're spiritually cursed. So the curse will be lifted. They'll have an understanding uh, because God saved them for a specific time. There's many of Gentiles on this earth that have not heard the gospel. I say millions of people. Uh, this is the big world we live in. And so um, during the seven-year tribulation, 140, at the beginning, 144,000 Jewish men will go out 
preaching the gospel, evangelizing. You had the two witnesses for three and a half years uh, at the Mount Olives, uh, Mount Olives, at the uh, uh, Temple Mount that will be uh, evangelizing. And then you have a, a, the whole seven years, an angel uh, flying around supernaturally uh, preaching the gospel. So the gospel at the end of the seven year tribulation will be worldwide taught, and then everybody will have an understanding. But as I, I again stress, those people that have heard the gospel and deny it, and then the rapture of the church, it's too late for them. They're deluded and they're damned to hell. Because God knows that those people would not have come to him. I've had many people say, when you rapture, I have an understanding, I'll, I'll be uh, uh, actually my older son says that a lot. Then I'll, I'll start reading the Bible and it's too late. And we don't know what that delusion is. We can speculate. It's like the alien deception, things like that. But we don't know for sure. It doesn't matter. It, it, we won't know the answer to that because we won't be here. And so that's why I stress and make these videos. And for understanding, showing people where they can look things up. And when people attack, that's when I'm like, get away. I'm not here to debate. I'm here to show you this. And then you look either choose to study that or not. Uh, no argument. You cannot. You know, I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to argue with somebody. Debate. I'm not very. I'm not good at that. I'm just a simple person, so I'm not into arguments. To me, a debate's an argument. It's an educated argument. Is what it is. So, and that's why I look at these things, and that's why I do this uh, to have understanding of uh, God's word and to. Uh, I love talking about God, and so. But it's important to have correction in things. I, I do like that. So I titled this a defense, a defense of the Rapture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. This is doc, by Dr. H. Winehouse. I do not see reference where I got this at. It might be one of the universities uh, that I go to on some things, on doctrine and stuff. But uh, I like to... Uh, he's a distinguished research professor of theology, law, and culture. And so I like to go to these scholars because I'm not scholarly and I look at what they have out there and uh, uh, just like I said, to give understanding. The letters of Paul to the Thessalonian church are written early in ministry, A.D. 51-52, and to the new believers, believers of Macedonia. These Christian eagerly, Christians eagerly accepted the teaching that Paul gave them in a short time. He was with them, but no sooner had Paul left then persons came into a mess to prevent the apostles' teaching. In regards to the coming of Christ for Christians, Paul apparently taught them they should be diligent in looking for Christ to come, 1 Thessalonians 4 or 5. Unfortunately, however, someone argued that Jesus had already returned. This puzzled the believers due to the fact that they had not been taken in the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Now, Paul wanted to provide additional evidence to assure him that Jesus had not returned and proved that was so. How biblical scholars have understood apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Biblical scholars have understood the word, Greek word apostasia translated falling away in the King James Version in four different ways. How one understands this Greek word may impact how one sees the return of Jesus. Let us examine the different interpretations below. So these are the four different ways they've looked at this. Apostasia refers to the man of sin. This interpretation says that the word apostasy refers to the man of sin in verse 3, what scholars call apposition. This was a common understanding in the first few centuries of the church, but few hold it today. The church father, Augustine, said, No one can doubt that he, Paul, wrote this of the Antichrist and of the day of judgment, which he calls the day of the Lord, nor he declared this day should come, not unless he came, uh, who is called, he came, he first came, who was called the apostate. Apostasy refers to falling away from the faith. A second view is the adopted by the King James Version, authorized version of the Bible, namely falling away. Under this view, apostasy means a falling away or defection from the faith. When this occurs, the Antichrist, man of sin, will arise, showing signs and wonders. This view seems to originate with the translation of the King James Version 1611, but is popular today. However, there is not a consistency recording who would actually fall away. Does it refer to the church, to the Jews during tribulation, or to non-Christians? 
Let us look at examples of those who hold to teach hold to each view. Professing Church. Theologian Charles Wright believes that the apostasy in 2 Thessalonians 2 3 speaks of a future falling away of those within the professing church who never truly believed in Jesus and believes the view is found in Revelation 17 and 2 Timothy 3 1. Jews during the tribulation. The second interpretation asserts that the Jews who reject God during the tribulation are in, are in view in the passage. Martin Rosenthal has argued that even as the word is in the New Testament, Paul was opposed to Jews, Acts 21 21. So this all would be how Jews will be act during the tribulation. He says that they will not totally abandon the God of their fathers and their Mosaic hope in favor of a false religion, humanism, and false Messiah, the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2-12. Non-Christians. Some have also viewed the falling away as referring to non-Christians as a whole. Hogg and Vine, as well as Chaffer, believe that the term referred to the way in which unsaved humanity failed to embrace the truth of God and the gospel of the church has been removed from the earth. Apostasy refers to revolt or rebellion against God. Understanding apostasy as a revolt or rebellion against stands in strong contrast to the former falling away. The latter implies a deflection from the faith or from God, while the former speaks of a forceful or violent rejection of God. A. L. Moore explains this view. The rebellion comes first. Here Paul uses the imagery drawn probably from Daniel eleven thirty six and Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, 2. The rebellion apostasy could refer to political apostasy or revolutionary revolt in classic Greek, but in the Greek Old Testament, it detonates religious rebellion of God. Joshua 22.22, Jeremiah 2.19. The thought is we suggest that the moment comes from Christ to appear in glory and all the for all the rebels against God to be unmasked and cast out, the forces of evil will rise as never before in the last desperate effort against God. Rather than a deflection from the faith or failure to embrace the gospel, the majority of scholars probably hold this option, believing the word expresses deliberate opposition against God and or his people even maybe a revolt against a public order government. This order would set the stage for the rise of the, the person who would bring back order known as the Antichrist. Apostasy is the rapture. The final view is certainly held by a, majority to, by a minority today, but that apostasy may refer to the departure of the church has been embraced by a number of scholars, including E. Schuller English, Stanley Ellison, Gordon Lewis, and Kenneth Woist. Since the view is rarely considered an option by commentators, it becomes incumbent, incumbent upon those who hold such a view to make a vigorous defense. Whether or not apostasia may mean rapture does not reply only upon the meaning of the term in Greek, but whether the idea of deflection or revolt in the end of times is found as an event in Paul's teaching, a well is likely a meaning the word of immediate context of the letter of Thessalonians. Regarding this first consideration, the nature of the idea of de detection or revolt in Paul's teaching, Elson captures the likely scenario. At the risk of being out of step with commentaries on a subject, may we suggest the greater acceptability of an alternative view. The evidence for a great singular defection from the faith, according just prior to rapture or to the day of the Lord, is really based on questionable ground. In the first reference, generally appealed to in 1 Timothy 4, Paul does speak of an apostasy from faith, but not as a unique end-time event. Rather, he described it as a trend or a movement that was presently already present. That is characterized in Arrhenius' doctrine, hypocritical living, hypocritical living, and improper legalism. And using the term here, he qualified it with the phrase "from the faith by itself," meaning meant simply departure. In the second reference to defection, Second Timothy three, one. Paul does not use the term apostasy, but merely speaks of evil in men in general latter days, times. His point here is that evil men will become more and more depraved as the age wears on, 2 Timothy 3.13. Thus, this passage is no real revelation to apostasy, but from the faith, and certain does not warn of uh, some specific final defection that will precede the rapture produced the day of the Lord. The remainder of the chapter will be, get, will be given to the meaning of the technical term apostasy and what means and best fitting its usage in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. How apostasy has been translated. Jerome translated the Greek Testament in Latin in the 4th century, the Vulgate. He used the Latin word decisio, meaning departure, for the Greek word apostasia. 
The meaning was contained in the earliest English translation, such as Wycliffe Bible, 1834, Tyndale Bible, 1526, Coverdale Bible, 1535, Cramer Bible, 1539, Breach's Bible, 1576, Bezel Bible, 1583, and the Geneva Bible, uh, 1608. The King James Version deviated from this translation, translating apostasy as a falling away. No explanation was given for doing this. How, moreover, Theodore Bezel trans, transliterated apostasy as apostasy rather than translating it since the 17th century in the consistent understanding of apostasy of modern translations has been rebellion. Arguments that favor apostasy is the rapture. The sense of departure in classical and biblical sources the word apostasy is regularly translated rebellion or defection. In Greek literature, before the time of the writing of the New Testament, in a few cases, however, it, it does have the sense of departure. The reason for this is differences in the context of the passages. At times, the word does not occur in context in which the manner of rebellion against authority or defection from a person, ideology, or religious faith is in view. Rather, the noun adheres more closely to the verbal meaning of depart, or some spiritual sense. The predominant meaning of the rebellion and at times defection is also found in the Greek Old Testament. One must be careful when deviating from establishment meanings in classical and biblical writings, yet one must also not be afraid to take the minority meaning with a spatial connotation when context warrants, such as may be in the case in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. The use of the de definite article with apostasia. One finds the use of the Greek article with apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Another example of this is 1 Maccabees 2.15, where defection from the Old Testament faith is generally viewed to be proper translation in apostasia. Those that came from the king were compelling for the defection in the city of Adonia in order to sacrifice. What is the significance of these two instances? Similar to this passage in 1 Maccabees 2, 2 Thessalonians 2.3 has an article and no such qualifiers as defection from God, so the context is determinative. For the meaning of apostasia. In the first two chapters of 1 Maccabees, there is a description of the Greek victory of Israel by Alexander the Greek until the time at Antioch's Ephemius, when the latter king invading Judah enforcing a desecration of, desecration of the temple. When one studies the context of 2 Thessalonians 2.13 in the same way, the context speaks of the coming of Christ for the church and the coming of man of sin after their stainer is moved. Idea of the second coming throughout 1, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul is deeply concerned with the coming of Christ for believers. This is clear in that, that each chapter of 1 Thessalonians speaks of Jesus coming for his people. The Apostle 1 Thessalonians 9 through 10 speaks of the rescue from the coming wrath of God's Son will survive for believers. Paul says that the Thessalonians give him hope and joy at the coming of Christ. 2 19. The pivotal message in the rapture. On the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, in which the apostle reveals that the dead would be caught up, from which we will get the word rapture, together with living saints to be with Christ. Chapters 5, 1 through 11, he continues the discussion found in chapter 4. He said that the believers, unlike those in the world, would not be caught unready for Christ's coming. One also finds discussion of the coming of Jesus in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, addressing the false teaching since he left Thessalonica, that church had, uh, that Christ had already come, he tells the Christians they needn't have no anxiety over his teaching. Contextual reasons for apostasy to be the rapture. What in the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 would lead one to accept the rapture rather than defection or rebellion is in view? Let us look at the immediately preceding verses in reference of the apostasy. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2 reads, now we beseech you, brethren, with regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or message or letter from us to the fact that the day of the Lord has come. The purpose of Paul's teaching on coming of Christ was to comfort the church. Comfort the church. Each text in 1 and 2 Thessalonians emphasizes this truth. If apostasy carries a sense of departure, following his words in 2.1, this would add to the comfort and the assurance. Moreover, he sought through verse 3, to assure them of the false notion taught by those false teachers who came to them that the day of the Lord had already come. Contrary to this false teaching, the day of the Lord would not come until two events occur. One is apostasy and the other is the rise of the man of sin. Since neither of these two had taken place, they should not believe that the time of God's judgment arrived. 
What makes the most sense in the context the day of the Lord had not begun because of rebellion against government or defection from the faith had not occurred or that departure of Christ had not occurred. Remember, in 1 Thessalonians 1, the encouragement was that the coming of Christ will rescue believers from the coming wrath. In addition to this, there are at least three more arguments that favor a departure rather than rebellion and defection in the passage. First, in the passage of rebellion or defection is the view the context speaks of rebellion or defection. But such is not in the view in preceding verses in 2 Thessalonians. Rather, as we have seen in the brief review of 1 in 2 Thessalonians, the coming of Christ is in view. Now we request you, brethren, with regarding to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1. Since the subject of the passage then is the coming of Christ and nothing in the passage or any my knowledge, his discussion of rebellion against government defection for Christianity is a prerequisite for Christ's coming. The most natural understanding of apostasy would be a spatial departure in concert with 1 Thessalonians 4. Certainly, Matthew 24 speaks of many being led to follow the Antichrist, Matthew 24, 5. But there's nothing about true believers following Christ, false Christ, as an indication of Christ's coming. Moreover, the events of Matthew 24 refer to the coming of Christ in judgment, not salvation, and relate to the time of tribulation afterwards. A statement of false teachers in the church is given in Acts 20, but again, those two those two not concern the man of sin. Second, the word apostasy as an article as an unusual article occurring with it, signifying that a specific event is in view and one is known as to the readers. The only event that fits with this special sense seems to be in 2 Thessalonians 2 1. In the former teaching of Paul in 1 Thessalonians, particular chapters 4 and 5, this would favor a rapture perspective. Last of all is the use of restrainer in verse 6 through 7. What is Paul speaking of when he mentions a strainer that keeps the man of sin from arising? Note that the strainer has, does not have to impact the apostasia. The term apostasia and the rise of men of sin are probably not the same event in verse 3. In the contrast, the restrainer and the man of sin leads support to apostasia being the departure. Verses 6 and 7 seem to be parallel apostasia and the man of sin. Generally, the restrainer in verse 6 and 7 has been taken to be reference to the Holy Spirit or to the church, though some have seen this as a reverence to government. What is interesting is the idea of restraining or expression in both personal and impersonal sense. The text reads 6 and 6, And you know that who restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. In verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do until he is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. So there is a what that restrains and a who that restrains. What is that means that man is sent from arising, and who keeps him from rising? I believe it is reasonable to conclude the presence of the church restrains him, the presence of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church restrains him. When the Antichrist comes to power, God will redeem no will no longer be God's redeemed will no longer be present. And as the Holy Spirit upon came upon the church in Acts two, he leaves the church in Second Thessalonians two. Interaction with those who reject the rapture view. The claim is made apostasy and never speaks of a departure in Greek literature, especially in the New Testament. I have already dealt with this early in the chapter and much more depth elsewhere. A person has probably a more important critique against apostasy being the rapture is Robert Gondry. His arguments have been even been convinced a stalwart pre tribulation rapture uh, teacher such as John Woolvard. Gondry recognized that the school of English, an early proper early proponent of the rapture view, did discover apostasy meaning departure in the classical period. But consider this discovery to be unimportant for the word 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Guthrie says that the four sources determining the meaning were found in the New Testament and the Greek Old Testament. The Com, common Greek in the time of the New Testament, and classical Greek. He unconvinced that the word apostasy carries a minority meaning in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Since the prominent meaning apostasy is revolt and religious deflection, he believes that this would govern its use in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. The only other instance of apostasy in the New Testament is Acts 21 21, when Paul is challenged as teaching all the Jews who are coming to the Gentiles. For St. Moses, Acts 21 21, the meaning is clear and deflection. Gaudry believes that the Gaudry believes that the two instances in New Testament, Acts 21 21 and 2 Thessalonians 2 3 will convey the idea of deflection from the faith, despite no such reference in 2 Thessalonians 2 3, because even without defection being in the word context, the word apostasy had inherently come to mean defection. 
Such is not the case. Context must always be considered in deciding the meaning of words, yet in the passages apostasy is translated revolt or defection. The context naturally leads one to a translation. That is not true in 2 Thessalonians. The context does not address those negative ideas, but focus coming of the Christ and what befrees the day of the Lord judgment. Consequently, the sense of spiritual departure is not outside the possible meaning. Conclusion In this short presentation, I have attempted to, to present evidence that the departure of the church from the church from the earth very well may be discussed in 2 Thessalonians 2 3. This meaning agrees with examples in Greek world and is consistent with the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 and the emphasis of the Apostle Paul Thessalonian epistles to comfort those early believers. Interpretation 2 Thessalonians 2 3 may be provide hope for us today. I believe there's a big, there's a lot going on against pre tribulation rapture doctrine. That's why I make these videos. And there's a lot of people that try to twist things. Uh, someone who seems to know a lot about it is. Uh, he has a uh, YouTube channel, Sooth Keep. That's Brian uh, Lee Brainerd. And he's been on Prophecy Watchers and everything else. And he's big about saying that uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 is about apostasy, uh, not a departure, but is about uh, teachings, you know, away uh, apostasy. Uh, the reason I make such a big deal about this is because I'm always I want to be correct when I do and do things, um, and and this is a prime example of context. When we study God's word, it gives us exactly how we are to do. Don't take a verse, take the whole chapter. What's the whole chapter about? The whole chapter is about like I, I talk about verses ten through twelve all the time about how God will send strong delusion. Uh, that happens after the Antichrist uh, comes out and. We're gone, and that's the whole point. Is because uh, I have the Geneva Bible, fifteen sixty edition, and and the Matthew's Bible, fifteen thirty seven, and I have the William Tundle, fifteen twenty six edition. Uh, I look through one of my studies and stuff, and I see it as a departure because in the earlier versions of the Bible, it does say departure. It doesn't say a falling away. Only at the sixteen eleven edition, King James version, and I have that. I use that in my studies along with the others. That's when it starts talking about falling away. So understanding uh, God's word and being correct is, is very important. Uh, a lot of times I explain to people, uh, people come up to me and say, what's it matter if you believe in pre-tribulation rapture, pre-wrath, uh, mid-tribulation rapture, or post-tribulation rapture of the church? It understands God's word because it gives meaning. You're searching, you're taking your time, you're getting to know God. It's a personal relationship. That's what this is all about. And that's the only way God wants that personal relationship. He wants you to come to know him. And so uh, that's what, what, what we were in our daily studies. I'm, I'm in my study seven days a week. This is what, what we're meant to be, uh, do. This is how you walk with God. Um, so it does matter because I stress to a lot of people, there's only one truth. And deny Jesus Christ before man, he says he will deny you before the Father. So if you're incorrect and, and we're in your timing of the rapture, then you, especially if you teach against it, you're denying Christ. He's going to deny you. And so uh, there, there, you know, I can stress there's four raptures are about to take place. Uh, the next at any moment, but we know it's going to happen before the pre-tribulation rapture. And that's the rapture of the, the body of Christ. And how do we know that? Uh, exactly. Uh, like a Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 12 of a future event. It says there's a time when God's going to send famine on the earth. But not of water, not of food, but a famine of famine cannot find this, the uh, scriptures, the word of God. Well, when does that take place? That's before the seven-year tribulation. Remember I say 144,000 Jewish men at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation will go, go about uh, the whole time evangelizing. The whole seven years, an angel will be out uh, supernaturally flying around, spreading gospel. The two witnesses for three and a half years will... Uh, be preaching, and then they're the the uh, mid tribulation rapture. There it is, right there. It's the two witnesses because they'll lie dead in the street three and a half days, come back to life, and be called up, come up hither. And then at the end of the seven year tribulation, there'll be uh, the modern saints, and that is uh, Revelation fourteen fourteen through sixteen. As we come down with Christ at a second coming. Souls will come out of the altar. The bodies will come out of the ground. 
So get the glorified bodies, and as we touch down the Mount Olives, that would be Revelation 14, 17 through 20, all to Armageddon. Everybody will come to Armageddon. Uh, just like in, in the Olivet Discord, before Jesus Christ starts talking about the, the body of Christ, he talks about how uh, when he comes at his second coming, he's going to send the angels out to collect his elect. That's what's taking place. It's a rapture. But people misunderstand. They think it's the rapture, and there's many raptures. As we say in uh, Acts, uh, Philip, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40, talks about Philip baptizing the Ethiopian official. So as he comes out of the water, he's caught up in the spirit, taken from one location to another, as toss, A-Z-O-T-U-S, where he starts preaching the gospel. That's a rapture. He was taken from one location to the other on the earth. That's going to happen with us. That's happened before with Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. A lot of people don't speak about Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken up and to one place to another. and talks about he was so overwhelmed that they, for a few days before he started uh, teaching, he was what happened to him? He just he couldn't he couldn't believe it. So uh, there's many raptures, and like I talked about Amos chapter eight, why is it they can't find the scripture? Because we're gone, the church is gone, and during that time, things all over uh, YouTube, these channels, videos I make, anybody, it's gone. AI will take things immediately, and uh, the the word is not going to be out there. And then sudden destruction happens, and I believe it's nuclear war and everything else, World War Three. I believe World War III takes place before uh, seven year tribulation. It's a time of chaos, a time of gap. Antichrist will come out of this and it will be peace. For some reason, people are thinking, well, we're, that do believe that there's going to be a rapture of the church uh, before the seven year tribulation. They think we're going to go right into the seven year tribulation. No, there's a time, space of time. How long that is, we have no idea. Uh, the, the scriptures don't say. And so uh, there's a, a gap of time. I'm going to throw some things out here at, uh, at real quick. Uh, there's always been the apostasy in the church. You know, wherever they, I'm at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, like I said, is about the uh, rapture of the church. I strongly believe that. Because there's always been apostasy. I uh, want to read here. It's the Catholic Church stance on pre-tribulation rapture by Boniface Magoli. Uh, cradle Catholic monk formed in Catholicism, priest, and theology in the Bible. Answer to the question, what are the opinions of Catholics regarding the rapture? He states, we don't believe it. It was introduced to the world, apparently, by the Mather preachers, increase and caught in the 1600s, and popularized by John Nelson Darby in the Great Awakening in the 1830s. We do not generally accept such late ideas into our doctrines. In this, we are in solitary with Orthodox churches. It mostly... Uh, therefore found in evangelical and fundamentalist denominations. He also states, it stands for the misinterpretation of what St. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where we are, who are left on the earth, will be caught up the air to meet Christ together with those who have already died. For us, the point of the verse is that the living and the dead will be reunited at the last judgment, so all may be judged together, but the details of how that works, when it may happen, or when we leave up to God. It is not important, more critical, is whether we be ready or not. And so, uh, I want to skip through something to you. The, uh, what he stated there, but he, he fails to tell people that in uh, 431 AD at the Council of Ephesus, the Catholic Church got together and they banned pre tribulation rapture doctrine. So it's not something that's new, just a few centuries old. It's been from the beginning, all right? It was given by Jesus. It was given to the apostles and then to uh, their students. And from 431 A.D., because they considered it heresy, punishable by death from 30, 431 A.D. to 1500 A.D., uh, pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, those that taught it were uh, murdered. There's no else way to say it. Murdered by the uh, Catholic Church. The rapture, uh, I'm going to give out to you some real quick, some people that have talked about it, taught about it through the years. Uh, this list will go all the way back to the first century A.D. 
1792, Thomas Scott, he taught that the uh, righteous will be carried to heaven where they will be secured till the time the judgment is over. 1763, James McKnight, he also taught that the righteous will be carried to heaven until the judgment is over with. 1748, John McGill wrote a commentary in the New Testament, teaches the imminent return of Christ, firstly in rapture, and then he will return again to judge the earth, Armageddon. 1744, Morgan Edwards, founder of the Ivy League School, Brown University, wrote of his pre-tribulation rapture beliefs. 1738, Philip Doddridge, commentary on New Testament, teaches along the same lines of John McGill, I mean, of John Gill, a pre-tribulation rapture perspective. Uh, 1687, Pierre Algeroux wrote Approaching Deliverance of the Church. Christ will return during the rapture to take his saints to heaven and later return to the Battle of Armageddon. 1748, Isaac Watts, known as the father of the English hymn, wrote of his pre-tribulation rapture belief. 1674, Thomas Collier makes reverence in the belief to the pre-tribulation rapture. 1591, Francisco Rivera wrote of his pre-tribulation rapture of the church beliefs. And as I said before, uh, 431 to 1500 AD, and he mentioned the pre-tribulation rapture of the church perspectives were outlawed by the Catholic Church and deemed heretical and punishable by death. The following wrote the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. 430, Augustine, Bishop of North Africa. 337, Ephraim Anispus. 204, Victorious, Bishop of Pato. 258, Cyprian, 236, Epitalius of Rome, 202, Arrhenius, wrote against the heresies. Uh, he had a lot. Uh, he was fighting the Catholic Church and wrote a 15-chapter book about against what the Catholic Church was teaching. 108, 108, Ignatius of Antioch, the third bishop, Patriarch of Antioch, who as a student of John the Apostle, his letters of extra-biblical works are, Letter to the Ephesians, letter to the Magnesians, letter to the Trillians, letter to the Romans, letter to the Philadelphians, letter to the Sumerians, and letter to Polycarp, Bishop of Rome. Understand Polycarp later was martyred by the church for pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. 99 AD, Clement of Rome, letter to the Corinthians, also known as I. Clement, uh, was an extra, uh, certain extra biblical book. When they say extra biblical book, means you can, you can put it with the Bible. It's, it's about it, uh, but it's not inspired uh Direct words uh, from God, but men of their understanding. So, even though the Catholic Church tried to destroy and suppress any writings and teachings on pre tribulation rapture of the Church, which is easily dated all the way back to the apostles themselves, they have failed. The pre tribulation rapture of the doctrine, which is the oldest of the biblical perspectives, could not be stopped. It originates with the apostles of Jesus Christ during the first century, taught to their students, and continues on this very day. Uh, Pre-wrath, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation teachings about the body of Christ are new teachings and not the original teachings of Jesus Christ nor of his chosen apostles or their students. Those are teachings of man and not of God. I put that in there to show the apostasy has always been there. Since the beginning, there's been apostasy. 325 AD, uh, Constantine, uh, what he had and, and added everything else and the paganism into, uh, of course, they had the Catholic Church at that time. Catholic Church is a cult. I have people that I love and care so much about are part of the Catholic Church. And there's nothing you can do to... They've been indoctrinated. And so you can pray for them and show Scripture. But that's all you can do. So I have an understanding. The apostasia has always been there. And so... Uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the heresies that are taught by certain churches. Catholic Church, uh, they have 15, well, I talked I already talked about the Council of Ephesus. There's 14 heresies taught by it. Baptismal, baptismal regeneration, celibate priesthood, confession, denial of eternal security, image worship, immaculate conception, infant baptism, Mary worship, mass, multiple authorities, papacy, priesthood, purgatory, salvation through works, true church history. Seven-day Adventists. Uh, they teach annihilation, denial of literal burning hell, multiple authority, Sabbath keeping, salvation through works, soul sleep. United Schools of Christianity, uh, deity of man, de denial of blood atonement, denial of deity of Christ, denial of deity of the Holy Ghost, denial of eternal security, denial of literal burning hell, denial of physical resurrection of Christ, denial of literal second coming of Christ, denial of sin nature from birth, denial of the Trinity, denial of virgin birth. Multiple authorities, reincarnation, salvation through works. They are similar to uh, a Church of Science, teach those heresies. And uh, the Worldwide Church by Herbert Armstrong, also 
churches similar to his teachings, Church of God. They teach Anglo Anglo Israelism, inhalation, biblical regeneration, baptismal regeneration, deity of man, denial of blood atonement, denial of the deity of Christ, denial of the deity of the Holy Ghost, denial of the eternal security, denial of a literal burning hell, denial of the physical resurrection of Christ, denial of the Trinity, polytheism, Sabbath keeping, salvation through uh, works of the true church. Now, I did a video a while back on heresies. It was titled something like... Uh, uh, I can't remember the title of it now, but uh, if you look it up in, in my on my YouTube channel, you'll find find where I did those. And so it's real great. It's like an hour and a half video and gives in great detail about heresies taught by different churches. Also different groups like uh, uh, Jehovah Witness, Mormons, uh, different things like that, how we're not to be learning this. And I get in depth into uh, the uh, charismatic movement, Pentecostal churches, Assemblies of God. Uh, my father-in-law was a same as a God minister, and he taught me correct. Uh, gifts of the Spirit are not done uh, correctly. There's a lot of people who, uh, about speaking in tongues and stuff, uh, something that we don't, we have the Scripture. We have the Word of God. So we don't need modern-day prophets or anything like that. We don't have that. We have everything complete there. These are all teachings of men. Uh, speaking in tongues, they misuse it in different things. Yes, there's people have come up to me and have it. You know, I spoke in tongues. It's hard to talk to somebody about tongues uh, because they spoke in tongues. Uh, my wife, a lot of times, she talks about her, her her mother spoke in tongues. Well, I'm sorry, but your mother was you know, probably was incorrect, and you could do that through the scripture. Uh, Paul himself was raptured up for instructions from God, and you can find that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, 10 through 5, but the whole chapter, I'm at 2 through 5, verse 2 through 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, but the whole chapter talks about it and how he's caught up in the third heaven and came back down. In that, he talks about he heard utterances in heaven, the language of him, but that was unlawful for man to speak. Paul himself taught. Uh, against the uh, misuse of tongues. And uh, so at that time, apostasy has it's been about. Apostasy has always been there. So, um, <coughs> my cat over there, she's knocking stuff around. She's cute. So, uh, there's always been apostasy. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, I believe is about the departures, talking about us. We're restraining, we have the indwelling Holy Ghost. Understand, the Holy Ghost is still on earth after we leave. But it will be used like in the Old Testament. The Holy Ghost will work like he did in the Old Testament compared to uh, through us. And he, he picked certain people in the Old Testament as prophets and stuff and to give understanding and used them like the apostles did miracles and different things like that. Like I said, these 144,000 Jewish men will have gifts of the Spirit. But we don't need such at this moment. And I and people would you know may say things and, and leave that's that's how it is. But uh they're being like I said, they're being led by the flesh. Uh I believe in healing, I believe in praying and God can heal people. But one of the gifts of the spirit is laying hands and healing people. There's no such thing at this moment. And you can argue and say, Well, that's true. Then I say if that's true, then why is there so much sickness? Why is it someone doesn't walk over to the hospital where all those kids are dying of cancer and laying hands on them? And heal everyone. So if someone has a gift of healing, shame on them for not going there and doing that. See, we don't have that in that way. We can pray to God uh, for healing, but uh, we don't have. We can go over there and I can lay my hand on you, say a prayer, and you're you're healed like that. Uh, Paul, even though he had to get to healing, Paul couldn't heal himself. It talks about actually in, in chapter twelve it talks about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he goes up, comes back down, God allows uh, Satan to put a thorn in his side. Uh, what that ailment was, we don't know. Paul prayed for about it three times leaving, and Jesus Christ answered by saying, my grace is sufficient. And so Paul couldn't even heal himself. And yet people were known, Paul was known to have, uh, and that's where the Catholic Church takes these things, and, and you pray on, and then you have healing by touching this. You know, Jesus Christ, uh, the woman, uh, touched his garment, handed him his garment, and was immediately healed. 
So the power, the power of the pouring out comes from certain things. So yes, they try to uh, misteach on things like that nowadays. And like I said, we have the apostasy. And to rightly understand things to be in God's word, go to God in prayer and all this confusion today. Go to God in prayer and study his word and he'll guide you. The Holy Ghost will guide you. The key is being a born again Christian. You cannot understand everything unless you're born again. Uh, also, a lot of times I tell people to understand the Bible, the New Testament, written in Greek. So you need to go back and study the Greek, Old Testament, Hebrew. So you need to go back and use old Hebrew references for the Old Testament, Greek references for the New Testament. And to understand the body more, you need to understand the culture, study the culture of the Middle East. The body is not wet on the body. The, the Bible is not Western. It's Middle Eastern. So you, understanding the culture of the Middle East gives you better understanding. But as I say, you truly cannot understand the Word of God until you're born again. And that's the key here is to get people born again into God. So I hope this gives instruction and uh, uh, motivates you to study God's Word more and get in this Word and just, just see what God's given us so much. I look forward to meeting you in heaven someday. Thank you. God bless you.